The Dangerous Days of Daniel X by James Patterson, Day 1. True Confessions. If this were a movie instead of real life, this would be part the part where in a strange, ominous voice I'd say, take me to your leader. But since you are far more important in making a difference in this world than the Earth's leaders, and last time I checked on the internet, those leaders seem to have more than enough on their plates, and for the most part, I'm not a total dork. I'll just go with a simple hi. My name is Daniel, and this is the first volume of my life story, which hopefully will be a very long and distinguished one. Why should you read it? Very good question. Maybe because this is your planet, and you have a right to know what's actually happening on it. And more important, off it. Trust me, there are legions of strange and disturbing creatures out there you probably don't want to know about. Like the fast-breeding creeps with burnt-looking metallic faces and deer horns bristling above hornet noses and stingers who populate the American Midwest and parts of Europe. Or some very nasty slug-like thingies with gels like water balloons about to burst all over much of Japan and China, as well as New York City and Vancouver, plus a host of human skeletonish freaks with tentacle hair and green multifaceted fly eyes, some white chocolate colored cretins that look like giant human babies, only with glowing television fuzz for their eyes and mouths, and a praying mantis looking race with shrunken heads, long red dreadlocks, and a pathetic need to kill, operating in the general area of Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Maybe I should stop talking, though, before I get too far ahead of myself. To those of you who feel that you've heard enough, let me say I'm sorry I had to give you a glimpse of what's really out there. And would you please close the cover of this book down tightly on your way out? Now the rest of you, I need you to do three important things. Number one, take a deep breath, or deep, deep breath. Number two, disregard everything anyone has ever told you about life on Earth. Number three, turn the page. Prologue, that wretched list. One. I wish that I didn't sometimes, but I remember everything about that cursed, unspeakably unhappy night 12 years ago when I was just three years old and both my parents were murdered. I was taken in an ordinary can of Play-Doh down from the playroom shelf when my mom called from the top of the basement stairs. Daniel, dinner will be here, be ready in five minutes. Time to start wrapping things up, honey. Finish already? I made a face, but my last, my latest masterpiece isn't done yet. Yes, mom, I called. One minute. I'm making Play-Doh history down here. Of course you are, dear. I would expect nothing less. Love you always. Love you back, Mom. Always. In case you've already noticed that I didn't speak like a typical three-year-old, well, you should have seen what I was building. I stared at the museum-quality replica of the lighthouse of Alexandria I was trying to finish. Behind it, all the way to the edge of my work table, stood matchless reproductions I had made of the remaining seven wonders of the ancient world. The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Temple of Art Artemis at <coughs> Ephesus, the Mausoleum of Mausolosus, the Colossus of Rhodes. I would have liked to do the Cathedral of Notre Dame and the Chrysler Building as well, but I was only allowed one hour of playtime a day. I squinted suddenly as I spotted what looked like a tiny, flat, black seed climbing up the side of my miniature lighthouse, and really moving, too. Whoa there, little guy. Where do you think you're motoring to? It was an arthropoda, arachnida, acari, mestidida, I thought, recalling the phylum, class, order, and suborder of the tiny creature at a glance. A tick. A young male dog tick, to be exact. Hey, little fella, I whispered to the tick. You want a sightseeing tour? Two things happened next, almost simultaneously. Two very odd and unforgettable things. There was a strange shimmering at the back of my bright turquoise blue eyes. And the tick slowly rose onto its hind legs and said, Hey Daniel, my brother, you do real nice work. Cool lighthouse. Chapter 2 I laughed hysterically at the lickety-split quick tick crawled as it crawled higher and higher on the lighthouse. Well, technically... I was the one making it crawl and tell jokes with my mind. Yes, you heard that correctly. I was causing the tick to do tricks and also talk. It's a talent I have. Long, long story. Good story, but not for right now. Something earth-shattering was about to happen at our house. Anyway, I had the little fellow give a wave before it flipped forward and 
did a one clawed handstand on the top of the lighthouse. And at that exact unforgettable instant, I suddenly flew back off the bench as a wall-shaking explosion detonated in the room above my head. Something enormous had just crashed into the kitchen. Was it a freight train? A plane? A sick feeling ripped through my stomach. Where was my mom? The list. I now heard a deep, strangled voice roar from the kitchen above. You think you can hide it from me? I know you have the list, and I want it. Now. I climbed to my feet, my mouth open, my eyes wide and locked onto the ceiling. Don't hurt us, please, my mother sobbed. Who are you? What list? Wait, wait, hold on, I heard my father say. Lower the gun, my friend. I'll get the list for you. I have it nearby. The list is here? The deep voice loomed once again. Right here in this pathetic little hovel in Kansas of all places? Yes. Now if you'll just lower the... I fell to the floor again as a string of deafening explosions drowned out my father's voice. Shooting, I thought. My eyes clenched shut, my hands flying to my ears. In Opus 2424, I realized with the same instantaneous knowledge that I had about the arthropod or acrid, arachnida, akari, mesalula, the dog tick. Then I heard my father call out, We love you, Daniel. Always. The clanging echo of the shots hung in the silence after the Opus finally stopped. Stay right there. Don't get up, either of you. As if you could, the stranger said with a nasty laugh. I'll go find the list myself. Mom? I thought, tears flooding down my cheeks. Dad? Then another terrible thought entered my mind, and it was bright and, ur and urgent as a neon sign. The aliens are here, I whispered, and reached up and clicked off the basement light. I prepared to be eaten, or maybe worse. Chapter 3. I was trembling and pressing my small, vulnerable body up against an old water heater, petrified about what might have just happened to my mom and dad, when a beam of violet-tinged light shone down the stairs into the basement, and then I saw it, a six-and-a-half-foot tall praying mantis. At least it had taken that terrible form tonight. From behind the water heater, I stared in horror at the creature's long, grossly bulging, plum-colored body, its small, almost shrunken head, its large, liquid black eyes. What a foul beast! It had long, stringy red dreadlocks hanging down between its antenna, and a dull, black, metal assault rifle cradled in its sharply jointed arms. I know you're down here, boy, the double XL sized insect said with a slow, horrifying roll of its stock-like neck. I am called the prayer, and there is very little that the prayer does not know. If you come to me now, I may go easy on you. May. But I do hereby promise, cross my heart, and hope to live forever. If you continue to make me play this silly game of hide and seek, and you are going to learn the meaning of the word punishment. This abomination, this beast that dared call itself the prayer, proceeded to tear the basement apart, obviously looking for the list. Powered by its massive legs, it suddenly leapt upstairs and trashed the rest of the house, screeching, List! 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 Then it was back in my play space, looking for me, no doubt angrier and hungrier than ever. The prayer smiled e eerily then, flashing jagged, yellow, broken bottle shard teeth. It covered 15 feet of the room with a single hop. Game over, you pathetic little puke meister. Maybe you know where the list is. Do you? Do you? That's when I realized that behind the thick wall of fear, my mind was actually trying to save me. Of course, I thought. I had a plan. A shred hope of hope that could salvage my life. The prayer swung its evil-looking head around the side of the water heater and found absolutely nothing. Chapter 4. The Repugnant Freak gasped with surprise and outrage. What? It screeched at the top of its voice range. Not possible. I smelled you there a second ago. Well, technically, I was still right there. I looked cross-eyed at my new beak-like <coughs> hypostomy as I scurried away on my new eight new clawed legs. The answer to my immediate problem had been straightforward. All I needed to do was make myself less conspicuous to the murderous beast. Do you follow what had just happened? The full significance of it? It is important. You see, my abilities didn't stop at being able to make ticks talk and do tricks. Now, I was the tick. I had transformed myself. Towering above me like a skyscraper, the prayer opened its razor-sharp jaws, and there was a bubbling, wet, sickening sound. Then a jet of jelly-like blue flame shot from his mouth. The basement walls, carpet, and ceiling caught fire in the blink of my eyes. Take that, you little nothing. I flame-broil my meat, like Burger King and... Beezlebub, 
Still in tiny tick form, I raced away from the smoke and scorching heat until I was crushed, be crushed against the basement's concrete foundation wall, which now seemed like as big as a cliff to me. I reached up tentatively with one of my claws. Some good news at last, my claw stuck to the concrete like super glue. Next I was scampering up the wall behind the prayer's head. Then I jumped and landed smack dab in the center of the alien's greasy dreadlock hair. I locked my hypostomy down tight like a seatbelt on a strand of his hair just as the homicidal prayer jumped effortlessly to the top of the burning basement stairs again. There I got a horrific, never-to-be-forgotten look at my mom and dad lying face down on the kitchen floor. I knew they were dead, and there was nothing I could do for them. I knew it in my heart and soul. I just couldn't believe it yet. Couldn't accept it. Then the prayer smashed through the kitchen window and burst into the night. Failure! 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 It bellowed. I hate failure. Where is the list? Something struck my head then. The end of a tree branch, maybe. And I found myself flying through the cold air. The breath was knocked out of me, and I landed hard on the packed dirt floor of the woods behind our farmhouse. I was a three-year-old boy again, transformed, no longer a tick. I stood and turned back and stared in disbelief and terror that could find no voice at the awful moment. Already our house was a blazing shell of its former self. My mom and dad were dead and being incinerated inside. There was the sound of a glass shattering as the upstairs window to my bedroom blew out with the heat. Then for a long time there was the roar of the flames and my soft little boy cries as I stood alone in the world for the first time, orphaned and homeless. I recall the song my mom used to sing to me, Starlight, Star Bright, First Star I See Tonight. She and my dad loved the skies and the stars. And I remember thinking very clearly as if I had suddenly grown up on that horrifying, unforgettable night. I know where the list is. My father has taken me to see it many times, maybe for just this reason. And I know what it is, the list of alien outlaws on terra firma. And I know who I am, Daniel, son of Grath, son of Turfdrun, the alien hunter. No last name, just Daniel X. I have to tell you one more thing about that night. I must get it out. Even though I was only three years old, I am ashamed that I didn't fight the prayer to the death. Daniel X, alien hunter. Chapter 1. Twelve years have passed. I'm 15 now. All grown up, sort of. When I tell you that I've seen it all and done it all, I'm not lying or boasting, though sometimes I wish I were, and that I lived a normal life in some place like Peoria, Illinois, or Red Bank, New Jersey. Since the death of my mom and dad, and in my years as an alien hunter, up to and including the present moment of extraordinary jeopardy, I've been kidnapped by faceless metallic humanoids twice. I've been chased and caught by a shape-shifting protoplasm in London who wanted to make me into a jelly sandwich without the bread. I have done hand-to-antenna combat with an entire civilization of insects in Mex Mexico City, <clears throat> Cuernavaca and Acapulco. I've had my face run over again and again for days by self-replicating machines that were about to take over Detroit. And wait, it gets worse. A billion or so little wailing <laughs> mouths connected by an electrical network to a single mind. I don't know how else to describe them ate and digested me in Hamburg, Germany. I will not tell you how I got out of that one. But this particular creature, currently right in my face, was really, really testing my limits and my patience. Chapter 2. Its name was Orking Jafolnaga, and it was number 19 on the list of alien outlaws. I had caught up with it in Portland, Oregon, after a month-long search through Canada and the Pacific Northwest with a near-miss capture attempt in Seattle. More to the point, it was at the moment blocking my escape out of a disgusting sewage pipe underneath the fair city of Portland somewhere, I believe, between the Rose Garden Arena and PGE Park. Orking was actually living in the sewer, and on this particular night at around 2 o'clock, I had come on an extermination mission. I despised this kidnapper of the elderly and their pets. Dog liver is a delicacy on its hideous home planet. I can describe, best describe this alien freak as part man, part jellyfish, part chainsaw. You're very impressive and scary, Orking. May I call you Orking, I asked. Is that your last wish? The creature growled and then spun its immense buzzsaw toward my eyes. Oh, I hope not. Say, I've read, <coughs> I've read you have level four strength. True or false? Orking took out a quarter and bent it in half, with its eyelid. 
In your shapeshifter too? I pretended to marvel, or grovel, I guess you could call it. Rather than a simple yes or no, Orking changed itself into a sky kind of squid with a human face featuring a mouth with hundreds of teeth. The entire changing process took about five seconds. Interesting, I thought. Could be something to work with here. That's it. That's all you can do? I asked the squid thing. I came down into this sewer for that? That's nothing, you little chunk. Orking snickered, frowned, and burped up something resembling a dozen oysters <coughs> sands the half shells. Once again it began to change, only this time I leaped right inside the confluence of shifting molecules and atoms and photons. How brave or dumb was that? How creative? Then I used my level 3 strength, for all it was worth. I punched and kicked gaping holes into the still unformulated creature. I fought as if my life depended on it, which it obviously did. Then I began shredding the murderous monster into pieces with my hands. It was terrible and gruesome and took hours to accomplish, and I hated every second of it, every shred. But when the deed was done, I was able to cross number 19 off my list, and I was one step closer to number one, the prayer, who had killed my mom and dad. All night's work in the sewers of Portland.